Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Greta Thunberg said we have to get out of our comfort zone if we're going to think of ways to combat net zero carbon, or to achieve net zero carbon and to combat, combat climate change. And I hope that what you will hear from our speakers this afternoon, our eminent speakers, will, will take us all outside our comfort zone into a place where we want to do something. Because there are things that can be done. And Renato's kindly referred to uh, reports that indicate how, how, how we can make changes uh, that are effective in construction. Why is that important? Because construction building operations account for 39% of all global emissions. So if we think it's someone else, it isn't. Here we are, we are the leading construction law and procurement practitioners in the world in a sector that accounts for 39% of the emissions. So we want to reduce those. And we all know that there is an enormous amount of innovation and effort. Every leading firm of engineers, every leading contractor working tirelessly on this. What happens? Their solutions are costed out because they're seen as too expensive in a lowest price procurement review. Their solutions are kept secret to win the next tender, so we don't have a process of learning. Well, we haven't really got time to say it's, oh, we can't afford it, or it's a competitive advantage so we can't share it. Uh, there are different things we can do. Renato referred to two reports that we will touch on today. I will also go back to the FAC1 Framework Alliance contract, which was another King's research output in 2016, which has as an objective, a success, success measure, a target, and an incentive, net zero carbon, and which has been very widely adopted. Um, and this is my shout out for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about that and who is on LinkedIn, follow Alliance Steering Group, and you will get updates on green projects and other projects using that form. Um, now, COP26 said, in order to address climate change, we need radical collaboration throughout the construction supply chain. That's their words. What COP27 is concluding today, I don't know. We will find out. But COP26 set an ambition and a range of commitments that other world events have sought to undermine. But it was very clear on what is needed in the construction sector. And the common themes from the reports I've referred to are actions. Actions in the way that we frame construction strategy, the way we undertake procurement selection processes, the way we put together our contracts, and the way that we manage our projects. And we can't have that fragmentation where people are a specialist in one of those fields and are indifferent to the others because it ain't their problem. So we have four eminent speakers today. And before you point out to me that I invited two of them to fly here from other countries, I'll say that I have not been on a plane for over three years, so I am their carbon offset. So leave, <laughs> leave them in peace to do their thing. So we have Dr. Roxana Vorniku, who is going to look at the Center of Construction Law report that was funded by the SCL that Renato referred to, which is entitled Procuring Net Zero Construction. It is looking at a variety of means through which procurement and construction can achieve net zero objectives. Roxana is co-managing partner of Sibu and Vorniku in, in Bucharest, a very successful boutique law firm. She's also a research associate at King's, and she's co-author of that report. So who is better placed to talk on it? We will then have Rebecca Rees, who is a partner in Trowers and Hamlins, looking at procurement procedures um, and net zero proposals, as I say, how to stop them being costed out, how to, how to have them assessed for their value so that they get adopted and people can see them as affordable and practical rather than optional. Um, Rebecca is head of public procurement at Trowers. Um, she's a leading national expert in public procurement law um, and is a, an expert in government procurement, government contracts. She's also engaged as on the Advisory Council of Nuclear Waste Services and indeed on the Competence uh, Committee as part of the Hackett Review. We'll then have Professor Sara Valagutsa, um, another person who I've collaborated with uh, for many years with great uh, pleasure and, and terrific results thanks to her, her dedication. And she is going to look at bringing net zero to life in Italy. And Sara is very well placed to do that. She leads her own law firm. 
She's also a professor of administrative law at the University of Milan, looking at green procurement and environmental law, among other things. But she's also led the introduction of collaborative procurement in Italy um, and linked it to building information modeling because whole life procurement, which is a feature of reducing our carbon footprint, does depend on information that connects the capital and operational phases. And digital information for another subject on another day has departed over the horizon with its own language and its own adherence and has left normal mortals behind when actually we need it if we're going to deliver proper integrated procurement. And finally, we have Jason Russell, who is Director of Business Transformation at Atkins. And he leads advice on, on procurement strategies, digital integration for people like HS2, National Highways. He's a senior visiting lecturer at King's, and he's going to look at case studies of net zero procurement action plans. Now, we talk about procurement. Procurement sounds like we will be waiting for the next time we need a project or a program of work, and then we will go through an evaluation process, and in a two or three years' time, we'll appoint someone, and then they can start delivering our net zero strategy. We don't have an extra two or three years. Uh, we should look at what can we do under current contracts with the current players to frame their commitments? And it's not that they don't want to. We have clients, local authority clients that Jason will look at, who have climate, strat uh, climate crisis strategies declared. As I say, we have engineers and contractors with a wealth of ideas. But without contractualizing that in an action plan, it's so easy for them to be misunderstood or lost or delayed. So you have um, an extraordinary range of speakers. We will go through all four talks. I really hope that we will have time for some discussion on this theme. You will, of course, be able to catch them over drinks later on. But I feel with a theme like this, you know, it would be terrific to have your, your questions and comments, but hold on until you've heard these four outstanding speakers tell you how to do this and, in each case, share case studies with you, which I'm sure you want to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to be speaking today in front of you on a topic that is so important to me. It's um, particularly important because, as David mentioned, I'm going to be sharing with you the results of our work in the past years at King's, namely the research paper on procuring net zero constructions that was uh, picked up by the government in the playbook and in the guidance on net zero carbon. And it's also important because this is a very important topic for me, climate, climate change and the net zero carbon target. Now, each and every one of us has its own um, interior reasons for which they would pick up climate, uh, the climate change fight. My particular reason is my two-year-old son and the fact that I have a moral duty to leave this place, uh, and to leave the world a slightly better place for, for him. As procurement and construction lawyers and researchers, that there's not very much that we can do, but uh, um, I'm pleased to believe that with this work and with this research pep paper, we have, we have put our two pennies in, in this fight. Um, maybe small, a small penny for the climate fight in general, but uh, we believe important for the industry. Kind of like the um, reverse small step for human, big leap for mankind story. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, our research, research paper and the solutions that uh, it proposes alongside the solutions proposed by the government in the net zero carbon guidance and the uh, construction playbook. I'm then going to look at uh, FAC1 and TAC1 and how these two contractual instruments um, deliver those solutions. Um, I'm then going to briefly refer to action plans, net zero carbon action plans. David uh, mentioned uh, briefly the fact that we don't need to wait for a new procurement process to embed one in our project and to make it binding. But Jason, I'm sure, is going to speak in more detail in an interesting presentation about that. And then I'm going to 
I'll briefly refer to a very powerful synthesis and message that Professor Mosey coined as the key to delivering uh, improved value and net zero carbon through construction. I've mentioned many times uh, the word solution today, and I will probably mention it a couple of more times. I like it very much, and I like the coincidence with the fact that today at COP27 uh, is the solution day. Our research paper builds on the COP26, um, the COP26 summit results, and we're really looking forward to seeing what uh, will happen this year in, in Egypt. Uh, but I find it particularly interesting that this year they've chosen a thematic approach with uh, days focusing inter alia on decarbonization, finance, and as I've said, solution. I find it interesting and powerful because we believe that with the playbook, with the net zero carbon guidance, and with King's research paper, we do stand in front of immediate solutions that can be put in practice and that will deliver long-term results. So there's no need of reinventing the wheels somehow. The solutions proposed by our paper and picked up by the government are circular themselves and they are holistic, referring to procurement strategies and processes that integrate client strategy and expectations, early supply chain involvement, team evaluation and bidder proposals, specialists and supply chain collaboration, framework alliances and shared learning, whole life procurement in digital information, action plans, and leadership. On supply chain and long-term contracting, the government mentioned how important supply chain decarbonization is, alongside modern methods of construction and building information modeling and other digital tools. In our paper, we show that supply chain decarbonization often requires more intensive supplier collaboration which is to educate supplier about decarbonization levers, to provide technical advice, to enable long-term asset upgrades and cultivate continuous improvement. And we also show that setting procurement standards for suppliers is one of the most powerful direct levers to address upstream emissions. Another important aspect is the early market engagement, which can help the whole life approach. The government acknowledges that embedding a whole life approach at an early stage is essential. And one of the important challenges that the construction industry is facing is that we are still focusing on procurement of the capital expenditure phase that covers project design and construction, rather than on procurement of the repair, maintenance and operation phase, and its potential for the whole life approach and long-term efficiencies. One contributor to Professor Moses Constructing the Gold Standard Review described whole life procurement as the unattainable holy grail of the construction procurement. Well, I really hope that that's just a pessimistic view and, and that the situation is, is more encouraging than that. However, it's encouraging but still complex. To implement a whole life approach, we need a change in mentality, first of all. We need the increased use of digital tools, such as BIM, of course, which can provide essential data for the whole life cycle approach. But we also need adequate procurement tender specification that look at outcome and value rather than price, thus creating a race to the bottom, of which I'm sure Rebecca will speak more of today. Another important aspect picked up by the government is the need for effective contracting and effective contracts that should be integrated with strategy, procurement, and management. The guidance and the playbook both look at FAC1 as a good example of framework alliances that have many of the features I've mentioned so far and will mention uh, throughout the presentation. Ultimately, and finally, the management of contracts and the transition to operation is equally important because monitoring asset performance can help us capture the lessons learned and disseminate good practice. Now, can't we just instruct zero compliance? Why are we asking ourselves that? Among, amongst other reasons, we're asking ourselves because do, whilst writing the paper, we've picked up on a very interesting project, uh, the so-called Chancery Lane Project, a pro bono initiative of legal professionals who drafted a series of climate contractual clauses. 
The project isn't focused on, on construction um, in particular. In, the, in fact, out of the 11 case studies that they list on the website um, as examples, none of them focuses on construction. But they do uh, look and they did draft uh, contractual clauses that are relevant for construction contracts. Inter alia, uh, clause on green project modification and a clause on carbon budget, um, on carbon budget reduction. Now, this initiative we think is laudable, but we must stress the fact that it is not sufficient. One contractual clause will not deliver the massive change that we are facing, and it will, be to, it will need to be um, integrated, to be combined with more complex contractual mechanism, and of course with a strategic approach using collaborative construction procurement and contracting systems. These uh, systems obviously entail supply chain collaboration, which is relevant, as I've mentioned before, from the supply chain decarbonization perspective. Amongst other features, FAC1 and TAC1 include particular provisions on the commitment of all parties to reduce carbon emissions, but also joint management systems and a shared timetable to review and compare the value offered by this supply chain decarbonization, to review the potential of more consistent, longer term, larger scale supply chain contracts, to jointly renegotiate or retend the supply chain contracts and to agree more consistent long term supply chain commitments and working practices. Uh, I'm only going to look at one case study today, a, a true trailblazer project and a construction playable pathfinder, the, million, the Ministry of Justice One Billion New Prison Program. This is an impressive project, if only for the fact that it's a strategic sub-alliance within the overarching FAC1 concluded by the um, Crown Commercial Service, uh, which is impressive in its scale, in itself through its scale. It's the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, framework agreement concluded in the European Union. It's even more impressive that it can foster strategic sub-alliances as this one. In this particular case, the client, the Ministry of Justice, entered an FAC1 multi-party sub-alliance contract with four contractors. All of them, with MACE as alliance manager, collaborate on methodology that puts a priority on net zero carbon, on modern methods of construction, and on digitization of the construction process. Contractors work together through FAC1 supply chain collaboration mechanisms using BIM and MMC to drive innovation and maximize social value. Supply chain collaboration attracts these innovations because, as we know, innovation usually happen, happens down the supply chain and creates net zero efficiencies through uh, early engagement and aggregated strategic commitments ac across all four prisons. Uh, the gold standard action plans. Um, in the construction of the gold standard review, uh, which is Professor Moses' review that uh, Renato and David mentioned, and the King's College Independent Review of Public Sector Frameworks that was published, endorsed by the government in December 2021, and supported by the industry. Um, there's an, an, a focus put on the, on the action plans. It's important to uh, remember, as David mentioned at the beginning, that you do not need a new procurement procedure to have a binding net zero carbon action plan. Um, and um, it's also important to listen to Jason that will enter into more detail on this topic. Finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I do want to uh, stop a bit on, on this uh, in, important phrase and message coined by, by David, the four eyes of net zero carbon procurement, which are in reality the four eyes of uh, improved, added, uh, improved value procurement. These four eyes are the following. Adequate strategies, which is intention. Intention of, this keeps on moving, I'm not doing anything. I don't know if I am, but. Uh, uh, okay, going back, the four eyes. So, so what do we need in order to deliver this? Uh, to deliver net zero carbon results and to deliver improved social values. We need to begin with an adequate strategy, which is intention. Intention of clients in terms of credible plans, 
commitments, time scales for meeting these net zero carbon targets with clear requirements for project outcomes and clear expectations. These clear expectations and requirements are need to be put in clear procurement documents. And this is the second I, an adequate procurement process, which stands for information. Information exchange between clients and prospective consultants, contractors and the supply chain members in advance of making appointments, demonstrating and evaluating how these plans, commitments and timescales will meet the net zero carbon targets. The third I stands for adequate contracts. These contracts entail integration of the plans, commitments and timescales that I have mentioned earlier, which need to be agreed in a multi-party way by clients, consultants, contractors and the supply chain members. And finally, the last I is management, adequate contract management, which is incentivization through instructions, through support, through guidance, and through motivation for clients, consultants, contractors, and the entire supply chain members. So the four I's of net zero carbon procurement, which are shown in that picture so simply, so clearly put, stand for intention, which is strategy, information, which is procurement, integration via contracts, and incentivization via an adequate contract management system, which should be, obviously, amongst other things, collaborative. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Sorry, but... Slides have a life of their own. Rebecca, <laughs> yes. over to you. See if you can get them under control. I have no hope with technology, so you'll forgive me as my slides race on, I'm sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, David, for inviting me to slip speak today. Um, right, slides. Uh, that's not... No. Is that going backwards? That's me. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, procurement procedures that attract and adopt net zero proposals. And I think just a bit of context to start off with. What I'm going to talk about is uh, procurement. We often get confused or, or we conflate two things. So I'm going to talk about a tender process, be that a public procurement process undertaken in a regulated manner against defined rules by a public sector body or a no-holds-barred, anything goes, process by a private sector client, leading into the selection of a construction warranty um, and a contracting model by the client under which the project is delivered. Um, and I've said there that breaks barriers, and there are plenty of barriers in practice at the moment that clients experience when trying to procure and deliver net zero um, solutions. And I've just listed some of those there. So, uh, one, emerging and shifting policy goals. At the moment, we see uh, the government getting successfully challenged by the Good Law Project on its net zero strategy. And when that happens, in my experience, clients tend to bury their heads in the sand and do nothing. And that is not creating a... Uh, what's a uh, glide path into a uh, net zero environment. Secondly, uh, a big bugbear of mine um, is that we don't have a universal taxonomy around the ESG agenda. Uh, we did um, hear Kim in our initial uh, plenary session today talking about ESG. And what I find is that when we start talking about sustainability solutions, we often talk at cross purposes depending on where we sit in the sector. Uh, so if we can be clear as to what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to achieve it, that uh, breaks down another barrier. Um, client expectation and expertise. Um, Often, many of my clients are like magpies. They like very shiny, very new things. Um, and uh, often, uh, that means that uh, how they fit within a system, a building system, isn't fully appreciated, nor how they're operated or maintained. And certainly, when coming to scope a contract in a meaningful way that the market can respond to 
in a meaningful way is often uh, skated over. And the results of uh, the ensuing procurement are, are disappointing or unsuccessful. Um, procurement of innovation. Um, if you are procurers um, and advise on procurement processes in the room, you will understand that we are notoriously poor at procuring innovation in the UK. We have a new, which is going to be an old and obsolete uh, procurement process very soon under the procurement bill called the Innovation Partnerships. Um, not very well used um, and the take up uh, wasn't as expected. But the procurement of innovation often um, is put in the too difficult box. And of course, with net zero, uh, depending on new technologies and being delivered in new ways under new contracting models, uh, often, again, the client puts that in a too difficult camp. Market readiness. We saw this when photovoltaic panels came to the market, that although the client knew what it wanted, the market in the UK was not ready to accept what it wanted. The financiers weren't, involved, um, weren't ready. They didn't understand how to financially wrap the product. The government wasn't ready for the huge take-up in feed-in tariff and kept on changing the policy and uh, lowering the feed-in tariff as we went along. So market readiness in its true sense is um, inhibiting net zero uh, achievement going forward. And then we are a sector blighted by well-known contracting practices that cut across team aspirations of achieving net zero uh, solutions and the performance in project delivery. And I'll come on to a case study as to how we're trying to work through that at the moment. Um, and as I've said rather tritely at the end, if we know the challenges, we can rise and meet them. The next challenge is... There we go. So when I talk about procurement... Um, what I think is good about the construction playbook that we now have is its focus on pre-procurement procedures. That we need to look at a net zero project when it is simply a twinkle in the client's eye. Um, we need to then make sure that the market is ready and that we are ready to go out and procure. And I commend the uh, construction playbook for the wider public sector to look at market health and capability assessments. Are we just going to plonk out a contract into the market to be bid for, uh, where there is no capacity in the market? Our neighbouring local authority or NHS trust has just put out an identical but slightly more attractive contract, and therefore we lose bidders because of it. Um, do we, are we ready as a client to deal with a supply chain that may well be based abroad, have a significant amount of for example, Chinese technology in its supply chain. Are we happy with the security that that might bring? Um, and are our uh, finance directors and governance protocols able to deal with the inherent risks that dealing with small and medium enterprises and startups bring us? These are all real life examples of where local authorities who want to achieve net zero have fallen on a political or, or governance led stumbling block. Um, stakeholder engagement as well. And yes, we do mean end users. Uh, sorry to use the word stakeholder, Renato, it is very inelegant. Um, but it also means bringing on board colleagues within our organisations to buy into the technology and the solution that we want to achieve. There are many routes to a net zero future um, and there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, very differing uh, views often within organizations as to how to achieve that. So bringing everybody along with us to ensure that the procurement strategy uh, holds water when somebody needs to sign it off. Um, expert involvement, not only procurement professionals to run the process and lawyers to underpin the contract, but also clearly technical advisors in the net, uh, to advise on the net zero solution, not only, as Roxana was talking about, on a capex basis, i.e. Uh, the capital uh, object we're buying, but also on its uh, maintenance, its operation, and indeed, potentially, its eventual disposal at the end of it. Um, and of course, what the construction playbook and the new procurement bill says is that you should also use pre-market engagement and preparation time for process and contract design. How are we approaching the market? Is it proportionate? Is it attractive? And will we get the bidders we need? 
So having sorted all of that out, what we aim to do is ensure that the procurement process is quick and painless uh, for all involved, including the losing bidders. Um, a lot of feedback on all construction projects, but particularly ones going out to the market for net zero solutions at the moment, is that the document packages going out with procurement are often incomplete uh, and, dare I say, incoherent, um, and bidders are unsure as to what to price. Uh, what is often happening as well is that we are getting um, existing construction employers' requirements, technical specifications, and pricing documents uh, on which bidders are being asked to price new uh, technologies as well, and, and the workmanship and the delivery proposals around that. Um, there is also a need in a procurement process to recognise where the gaps are. Um, I think... Donald Rumsfeld referred to them as known unknowns, but also to clearly scope in our procurement where the areas for innovation are, so that the bidders understand what they're being asked to do and the parameters to which that attaches. Um, minimum requirements, what are the must-haves of the procurement? Yes, we've got the technical solution and the performance outputs to that. Um, We've got the procedural guarantees of levels of information required to be sent back from the market um, and the guarantees, warranties and insurances that underpin both the delivery and the product. Um, but what about performance measurement processes and targets? What are those going to be? Um, and uh, how is the bidder confident enough to price a quality product into the tender um, and I would argue the answer to that is if it knows it's going to be put, picked up in contract management processes for not delivering it. Um, and then looking at award criteria, what are the priorities? And that doesn't necessarily translate into the imposition of weightings, but looking at the scoring rules and the methodology that you are adopting behind those weightings to ensure that what you're asking of your bidders drives the behaviours that they bring to the bidding um, process. Um, and uh, as David alluded to, pricing evaluation formula is key to this. Um, as I've said, you won't reach net zero at the end of a race to the bottom. And even when you um, inflate your quality weightings, if you are still prioritising a, a lower price uh, when you're evaluating price, uh, you will see that your bid quickly becomes a work of fiction. And even when you split something 70%, 30% quality price, that doesn't mean that quality is more important. It means that price is not important. And then all bets are off on the fiction front. Um, Let's go on to contracts. We've successfully planned, procured our net zero outcomes. Um, what I always like to do is take a procurement proposal, the successful bid, and take all of the, or list out all of the procurement promises that the bidder has made and convert them into contractual obligations, hopefully linked to performance measurement and even a penalty or so. Um, you would be surprised at the number of bidders that then come back and say, well, if I knew you were going to contractually oblige me to do everything that was in my tender, I might not have put it in my tender in the first place. Uh, and they say it with a straight face as well. Um, the contract is key, and you will know that central government is really gearing up uh, their project managers to manage the contract, that it is no longer acceptable to put it in the bottom drawer. And um, as we have mentioned, um, David's uh, gold standard recommendations on public sector construction frameworks are um, universally uh, required, not as an add-on or as a nice-to-have, but contractual processes that underpin a good project process to achieve the outcomes that were put um, in the bid in the first place. And I've set out on the slide the collaborative procedures that we would expect to see in any successful uh, gold standard contract. 
um, just to bring a few of them up. Uh, contractual timetables. Um, David told me about 20 years ago that if you don't put a deadline to something, the notebook is going to do anything. So contractual timetables focus the mind and ensure that projects run, uh, if not on time, not severely delayed. Um, we are also looking a lot in the net zero world at early supply chain involvement. Uh, tier ones don't know anything about net zero. They know a lot about contracting. They know nothing about products. We need to bring in the specialist supply chain um, product um, manufacturers and uh, the, the, the deliverers who, who are actually going to fit these products on site to the table as soon as possible so that we know exactly what they need to deliver the project to the time that we've set them um, and indeed the price. Um, design development processes I'll come back to in a minute on the case study. Um, and um, open book pricing mechanisms at the moment in both net zero and building safety particularly in this volatile market at the moment, we are seeing a lot of two-stage open book pricing. This not only gives the client um, the confidence it needs that it is paying what the market is requiring of it in terms of supply chain and labour at the moment, but also that um, we are not overcompensating the contractor in what we're asking them to do. Uh, performance measurement systems. Um, ESG is now being um, driven by funders, which I fundamentally disagree with, but money makes the world go round, so here we are. Um, they, a lot of public sector organisations now have bonds and other finance instruments that require them to report back on ESG uh, fundamentals. And you are what you me measure, um, and it's important that those are captured under the contract and fed back up case study, just to give you an overview. Um, we've been working on the uh, SHDF, UK Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund Wave 1 demonstrator projects. Um, the aim is to decarbonise the UK social housing stock on a fabric-first approach, so primarily quite boring at the moment, not a lot of tech, lots of external wall insulation, but the finish, the application of it and the detailing by the specialist supply chain is key to the success. And some of the pilot projects are now having their walls scraped off and reapplied. So the importance of getting it right first time is um, obvious to those people doing the scraping, I suppose. Uh, funding deadlines for uh, the uh, grant funding were extremely tight. Um, same for the building safety fund. Government spend it or lose it, but we've had six months to go from a standing start into a delivery phase with a fully functioning um, supply chain. Wave two is not much better. Um, the other challenges we've had is multiple clients with preferred supply chain choices. We've got innovative technical and delivery solutions that clients have not used before on buildings that haven't been tested. We are post-Brexit, post-COVID, in a volatile market supply chain. Um, the risk and pricing approach I'll come on to and tight timescales, as I've said. Uh, oh, I'm not allowed to do that, that one, sorry. Um, we are working with uh, some Midlands housing associations at the moment. There's a consortium of five housing associations. We've adopted the FAC one's um, alliancing framework and PPC 2000 partnering contracts are... Um, being used be uh, beneath them, not because we are Trowers and Hamlins, but because they needed a two-stage approach to undertake the works. Um, the multiple clients, same supply chain, because they're all in the same area. So what we needed to ensure was that they all worked together as sort of self-interested parties to ensure that the bids that went out to the local supply chains and specialist subcontractors uh, was um, neutralised so that we didn't overinflate the local market. Um, it was uh, lots of uh, different people, so we just felt the FAC one was the right home to create those collaborative relationships to achieve the project's aims. The one thing, the only other thing I will mention here is the two-stage open book approach is perfect for building safety and net zero works where you need to put up a ton of scaffolding for somebody to take something off the building to then put something on. We put it up, we paused, we saw what was needed, uh, the specialist su supply chain then designed, priced it, client agreed it, and then they got on with the delivery, the perfect uh, solution uh, is a two-stage contract. 
I've overrun, for which I apologise. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thanks, all the teams, King's teams. I have to find my slides. I will. No. Yes, the left one. No. Coming, coming. Here we are. So th thanks again. I just want to start with uh, some preliminary remarks on the situation we have now in Italy in the construction industry. Uh, starting, I would say, I don't know if uh, Renato uh, will agree with me, but uh, I wouldn't say that we have a real construction industry in Italy. Uh, why this? Just because the largest majority of the economic operators playing this market are SME, more or less 19%. So, this is the reason why I would not say construction industry. And then we do not have construction strategies. We just have norms, public and private rules and regulations. And we have case law, but we do not have a clear and well set strategy. This is quite strange. After the training that David made on us, maybe we will have in the next 35 years. Uh, but yes, I prefer speaking about this construction market. Now we are having a lot of troubles with the increasing of the, the cost, energy cost and raw material cost. And data show us worrisome, um, worrisome um, growth of contract termination. But interesting opportunities are coming because Italy has a lot of funds coming from Europe on the uh, plan for recovery and resilience after COVID. So now we have to solve these issues for, 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 because we need to. And the reform of public contract is expected in the next month with the new government. We will see what will happen on that. We are using collaborative uh, contract and collaborative construction procurement thanks to David Public and private client are using it. And for the case of decarbonization of the world of construction, as David said, the success measures and targets are really good for to be used for that. Um, then we are working on sustainable procurement. That is the, the, lar the largest picture uh, joining green issues and, and social value together. And so I, I believe we are in a quite good moment. Um, I want to show you some interesting data about the investment in construction in Italy. As you can see from the percentages in the slide, the sector is having a positive wave of optimism, um, especially if you see the residential buildings and renovation private side. We will see in a bit uh, uh, why. The reason is the factors for this growth, the main two factors in my opinion are the incentives assigned for the energy efficiency and the, refurnish, refur, the refurbishment of buildings, um, we will see. So, in a nutshell, how is the construction market doing? It's doing quite well. We are, uh, we are finding innovation at tender stage. We are using two-stage open book and bringing social value in the, uh, especially in the awarding criteria. We are receiving money from Europe and we are working on green procurement and gender responsive procurement. This is something very new for us. We are introducing courses in the university, master courses, so that's fine. Um, of course, we are in Italy, so conflicts are the, the issue we still have during the execution more than during the tender stage. That is quite interesting to notice. Um, what about the transition to decarbonization in Italy? I think we can, uh, we can um, see at least these five different levels. Um, the Italian government, government has these five stages for policies that have a role in the uh, decarbonization strategy in Italy. Um, I believe the, the most interesting and comparable level are the one of the regulatory level and the local uh, experiences on which I wanna stay for a bit. Uh, about the regulatory level, 
It's worth mentioning the experience of minimum environmental criteria. We have these criteria that basically are some parameters fixed by law um, to be used or supposed to be used by public clients in purchasing, in their purchasing for to meet environmental targets. Uh, the analysis shows that these minimum environmental criteria um, are not as used as expected. You know why this? Because SME don't want to have this minimum requirement because they are not still ready to meet the requirements. So public clients uh, tend not to use the, uh, these criteria. On the, other, on the other end, we have very strict NZEB regulation and building regulation that are norms uh, that now have become mandatory both in the private and in the public sector, both for new and renovated building. From this strategy coming obligations, we see some results. Um, yes, here we see the reason why there is a strong uh, increase in the investment on renovation. Um, going ahead with the, the exam of the regulatory um, level, I, I believe we have these three factors um, that just justify the increase uh, in the investment. Super bonus, conto termico, and white certificates, yes. Super bonus is a bonus. Is a bonus equivalent uh, to a tax deduction the tax deduction is equal to 110% of the expensive you have in your buildings for certain expenses, uh, energy efficiency expenses or other installation of photovoltaic solar system and storage systems, for example, or infrastructure for recharging electric vehicle. So here the idea is to give incentives like tax deduction if you improve your building with some green environmental target. Uh, then conto termico, again, other incentive. This is uh, the conto termico reserves incentives for small size intervention to increase energy efficiency and the production of thermal energy from renewable sources. The decision of the Italian government is to reserve uh, these, um, these incentive for public authorities and contracting authorities and their, their uh, contract. Uh, thirdly, white certificates, you know, uh, maybe these are tradable certificates attesting the achievement of certain uh, saving in energy. These have a great value nowadays in Italy, so you can do your energy efficiency with your building. You can ask a public authority to recognize the efficiency you, you, you had on your building, and then you have these certificates that you can uh, exchange on a platform or bilateral trading. I believe it's quite interesting to see how the regulatory level uh, impacts the tender level. This is a very interesting case, a uh, recent case of a uh, project for School for uh, the Future. The project is School for the Future, and this is a project uh, managed by the Ministry of the Education aimed at the acquisition of 212 new school projects all around the Italian territory, you see the red dots show the capillarity of this intervention. It's quite interesting also for what Rebecca said to see how they manage the tender document. Here, according to the N0 rule uh, at the tender stage and the environmental regulation, it is prescribed that new school buildings must achieve a primary energy consumption that is at least 20% lower than the NZEB uh, building requirements under Italian law. And this is a requirement for to bid. It's not uh, a an, an, uh, criteria for the evaluation of the offer. And then at least, a set, and this is the second one is very relevant by my side, 70% of waste generated during the execution, demolition in this case, has to be sent for preparation, for reuse, recovery, and recycling. Again, requirement of the, the, the design and the process for to be awarded the, the project. It's bound, and this is the last one, to increase in land consumption. This means that we look at the, the greening of building by different dimension and ZEB, and we join 
the circular economy, and then land consumption. That is maybe the most important um, feature of nowadays environmental policies in Italy. Some local experiences, um, what's going on in Milan? In the slide you see two different buildings. One is a private uh, and the other one is public. The, um, this one is Bocconi, it's a new university campus by the Bocconi University and the other one is the uh, headquarter of a public owned company working on the area of public services. I don't want to add more because I want to invite you to visit us. So just to seduce you, you can see the images. Uh, why Milan? Because in Milano, I take the case of Milano because uh, among the Italian city, Milano is most attractive for nowadays for the international investment. And this means that we have the pushing or the nudging, you can call it whatever you want, um, of the green finance. So are the inv investors asking us to be green in building and close to NZEP? Um, I believe, uh, if you look at the number, we have these two uh, very different data. More than 4,000 NZEP buildings are already existing in the city of Milan, and only more than 400 uh, have a certif environmental certifications. Why this? Because for us, according to the situation of the territory of Italy, it's very difficult to meet the requirement for to have the environmental certification. It's better, or we are used to fulfill, on the contrary, the NZEB requirement. Uh, and if we have some analysis uh, showing us that the virtuosity of the case of Milan um, are due basically to the urban planning regulation and the green finance, so just uh, really uh, briefly, urban regulation in, in Milan is, uh, I believe, very clever because it considers the attitude of developer investing in the city and the green finance uh, as a very key element. For this reason, if we take a look at the Milan urban planning regulation, we see that this is based on incentives again. So if the developer meets environmental targets, incentives are granted. Which kind of incentives? Reduction of urban services area that has to be uh, due by the builder or increase of the gross floor area or volume rewarding. So these are the reason, not, sorry, not ethical reason, but these are the reason for to have green, green, greening in the building sector in, in the city of Milan. You have the same incentive also from the technical requirement. And then, lastly, we have the idea, I, want, I wanted to quote the air quality and climate plan that was approved in the last February in the city, because the plan has an holistic approach for, to the adaptation policies for decarbonization, merging decarbonization and urban designing together with city planning. And this is quite interesting because we don't, we don't see only policies or certain policies, we try to combine the policies. Um, here again, a couple of images from uh, the new building, most famous according to the, what they did to improve the uh, environmental policies of building. Here, this is an uh, interesting building, quite new, private one. The building is equipped with lots of meters of photovoltaic panels that are, you can see, integrated into the facade, so it's very interesting. And the, the scope was to reduce energy requirement um, by the 70% in this case compared to the traditional building. So this is something also reputational for the subjects that will live in, in the building, according to the idea that you will uh, contribute to create these ethics of the uh, protection of the environment. In Italy, we had this year, we had the reform of con constitution, quoting for the first time the environment, the protection of the environment as one of the value of the Italian constitution. It's quite uh, important for us here, public building. They work the same, so reducing energy uh, consumption, looking for energy autonomy. This is uh, interesting. The, you see that there is um, an interesting use of materials for the en envelope of this building. We use lava stone, and this is very symbolic. It's a public building, as I said. 
So at the end, to conclude, what can we do to improve decarbonization? Here we, we didn't talk, but we have quite the same conclusion. So integrate the policies. Carbon neutrality is a part of a broader picture. Uh, we can't miss circular economy in construction because the waste, the production of waste and CO2 coming from that is incredibly relevant. So if we don't face a circularity in the production, we will not have building with decarbonization. In use incentives and measurements, not only in my, my, in my opinion at the, the urban planning level, but also in the contracts, as David said here, the FAC1 really ready to use for that. Using the supply chain, I agree, not only the T1, but you go uh, on the supply chain, taking the majority of, of uh, economic operator possible. Uh, digitalization, for sure, BIM, to have the information and to measure because policies and the regulation with incentives ask to be sure why they're measured if you meet or not the target. So BIM is really asked by public client to measure. Uh, and then, of course, strategic procurement and contract procurement can't be missed in this. Thank you very much for your attention. Afternoon, everybody. I, I was kind of, as I was sat there, I was reflecting on how we all see things differently, because I, I kind of sense that all of you just see me as the person who's between you and the drinks reception. <laughs> Whereas I see myself as today's headline act. So um, we'll see how it goes. Will this work? Oh. That's just confusing me, isn't it? Okay, the other way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so just what I'm going to talk about, and what I will try and do, because I am conscious that the drink's out and the, the white wine's probably getting warm, so I'll, I'll try and stick to some key messages. If you want to follow up any conversations, bring me over a glass of wine, and I'll be happy to talk some more. Um, what I was going to cover was just a little bit about me. Uh, I am Director of Business Transformation, and I know what you're thinking, who let the management consultant in the room, but um, I'll talk a bit more about what I actually do. Hopefully that will interest you a bit. Uh, I'll talk a bit about action plans, so they've been touched on. But my experience, uh, generally it's bitter experience, is that they're absolutely vital, and I'll just talk about why. Um, and then I have got a couple of case studies, which I'll sort of take you through. Um, and then just to sort of touch on, if you're interested in more, uh, where you can go to, to look for it. Um, first of all, about me. So, yes, I am Director of Business Transformation. I work for um, Atkins. You might be familiar with us. Uh, I do a lot of advice around investment strategies and digital strategies and delivery strategies and procurement strategies. Um, I'm not particularly a net zero specialist, although given where we are at the moment, net zero touches on pretty much everything that I do. So at the moment, I'm advising Welsh Government on decarbonising transport in, in Wales. Uh, I've just finished actually with, with HS2, where I was their digital engineering strategy lead, and obviously considering how digital engineering can support them in their, uh, their carbon reduction ambitions uh, for HS2. And I'm currently advising National Highways on investment strategy for road period three. So that's what they're going to spend their money on, uh, on the motorway network from 25 to, to 30. Um, but I've only recently become a consultant, so my, my background is very much public sector. Uh, so I was corporate director at Surrey, I was corporate director at Oxfordshire, and the case studies I'm going to share with you today come from that bit of my, uh, my career. So my sort of client perspective and, and sort of my, my frustration with everybody around me uh, and why they weren't really helping me in terms of the, the ambitions uh, that I actually had. Uh, and then, of course, the one final hat I have today is as a member of the Alliance Steering Group, which is kind of what I'm talking to you. That's the hat I'm talking with today. Uh, David mentioned them. There's some, some fantastic resources in there, which if you're interested in alliances and how alliances can better help you achieve strategic objectives, it's, it's really worth having a look. Um, anyway, so first of all, why is an action plan important? Now, I think in one way or another, I, I've probably been thinking about uh, kind of net zero environmental impacts in construction for probably about 25 years now. I know you think I don't look old enough to have been doing that, but, but seriously, I have been. I think for me, it goes back to kind of the late 90s um, and trying to think about how we could increase the quantity of recycled material that we were using. And my real frustration, I just see this endlessly in, in the construction sector, is that we, we have some really good ideas and we endlessly trial things. We just trial things and trial things and trial things and we never implement them, we never operationalize them, we never really change how we operate. 
I, I went to a, an organization who was talking recently about their net zero plans and what they're intending to do, and they were talking about this particular technique called foam bitumen. Uh, I'm an engineer by background, so you, you, I don't know if you like that or not, but um, foam bitumen is great. It, it's, a kind of, it's a cold product, so it's low energy. You can put a lot of recycled material in there for trying to build roads and things out of it. It's fantastic. And, and they were doing a trial of it. And you might say, well, that's really good. That's really sensible. They're embracing different ways of working. Foam bitumen was developed 70 years ago. So we've been using it for 70 years, and still people are trialing it, because obviously it's different for them. They're different. So the notion of actually having an action plan that doesn't just endlessly trial things, but actually commits you to doing things differently, and actually involves the client and the tier one, who, who do literally know nothing, and the specialists in the supply chain who really do know what to do is actually really vital to going away from just this endlessly trialing to actually doing something different. And I look in uh, sort of local authority clients that we work with. Many of those are, are, have just let contracts right now that will run to the period of time by which they have committed to become net zero. They've all declared climate emergencies. They've committed to become net zero. They've got contracts in place and make no real mention about how that particular contract, how that supplier should actually contribute to their net zero ambitions. So the case studies that I'm going to share with you are very relevant to this because you don't need to, as we said before, you don't need to wait for a re-procurement to actually commit to doing something a bit different. You can do it under an existing contract. And the two examples I've got is where I've done that previously, where we've introduced, through an alliance, a, a different way of working to actually achieve strategic objectives. The one other thing I should say before I press the wrong button and go backwards in my presentation is that for clients, this isn't just one thing they're trying to solve. Net zero is a very complex problem, but that's not the only thing they're trying to do. For a public sector client, they've got to achieve a net zero ambition. They've probably also got to grow the economy and they've got to grow jobs. They've probably got to try and make whatever it is they do safer. They've probably got to improve the experience of the user. And those things are often contradictory. And that's a huge challenge. This is a complex problem that they're wrestling with. I'm going to pick one button and see what happens. Hey, oh, good, it worked. Excellent. OK, so the first example I'll give, so this is um, back in my days at, at Surrey County Council. Um, this is actually going back about 10 years now uh, when this first started. This was a thing called Operation Horizon. Uh, Operation Horizon was basically a program to uh, resurface roads. So this was targeted at the worst condition roads in Surrey. It was a five-year capital program. For those of you who are familiar with local authority budgets, we, we generally staggered from one year to the next, not really doing any long-term planning. Uh, we had a good opportunity here to actually think five years. So we had a five-year budget that was set for us, helped by government, and that, that graph on the right shows uh, commitment from government to uh, the grant funding that came out to local authorities for being at a set level for uh, actually a six-year period. That allowed us to do some longer-term planning, which was a really rare thing. So in terms of an action plan, that was a really key enabler. So we were trying to repair 10% of the road network. At the time, we estimated the cost to be 120 million. The budget that was available for us over that five-year period was 100 million. Um, and fundamentally, our key objective here was about trying to deliver that program for a reduced price. That's what really drove us. It was a, a really simple target that you can set people. You've got to basically take 20 million pounds out of the cost of that program. So we brought together uh, the entire supply chain to try and think about how we could do that. Fundamentally, we needed a 15% saving. That was the key driver for this program. But we wanted other benefits. And I, I mentioned it earlier, for a local authority, it's about the local economy. It's about all the other things that you need to be doing in addition to just resurfacing your roads. Um, now, the contract itself that we did this through had been let around about two years before this. So it was a 10-year um, term contract, but obviously when we first let it, we really didn't know what we would actually be doing over that 10 years. In fact, when this particular contract was let, austerity, or the first round of it, had just struck us. So this was kind of like 2009 we were pulling this together. We didn't think we'd have very much money. We had no idea really what we were going to be doing. But obviously as things developed and as they emerged, we could start to define, particularly over a five-year period, what it is we were going to do. So we knew much more two years into the contract than we knew when we first procured it. So that opportunity to actually go back and revisit our priorities and look at how we could secure improved prices, how we could get other benefits, was really critical to us. Things were quite different two years into how they'd been when we first let the contract. 
Now, obviously, what we needed was a very open and transparent process. This had to be genuine cost reduction. And of course, you can imagine the reaction in the supply chain. Oh, what's going on here? Then this is squeezing margins. This is trying to push the problem down the supply chain. Nobody believed us, and, and why would they? So it had to be genuine cost reduction. Um, this is kind of a timeline. So I so said the contract itself um, started back in 2011. Um, we started thinking probably within a year, actually, that we wanted to maybe do something a bit different, but it took a bit of time to go through that process. We needed to get cabinet agreement to basically a five-year funding commitment. Um, we started to do some joint planning with this with the tier one that was um, Kia. We then ran through a number of processes to appoint supply chain partners who would actually deliver the program. Uh, eventually, that was led to uh, Marshalls and Aggregate Industries, so that was Kia's uh, process to do that. We developed in, uh, integrated teams, so teams of people, client, tier one, supply chain, who would design the whole thing. We had a peer review, so we got some colleagues to come in and, and challenge our thinking. And then we actually started the program in 2013. Now, the appointment of the, of the specialist was very much linked to our strategic objectives. So we defined what we wanted from this, and their appointment was based on what they could tell us they could do to do it differently. And they generated all of the ideas. It wasn't Kier. And you know, full credit to Kia for, for doing this really well, but the ideas for what you could do differently came from those specialists. They're the ones who knew what we could do. Um, in terms of what we got out of it, so from that initial procurement exercise, we got a basic discount on the contract. So by actually being able to give them some certainty over that five-year period, by giving them some certainty around volumes, um, some other things, access to storage areas, you know, various things we could do, really simple stuff. And there was nothing clever or innovative, innovative about this, but it was listening to supply chain and, um, and trying to create the conditions that would enable them to do what we wanted them to do. We could take 12% out. Through then value engineering, so for those integrated teams from project by project actually working together to look at designs and how we could do it, we estimated a further 4 to 8%. And there were other things we saw as well. We talked before about whole life value. This gave us a real opportunity to improve whole life value. And, and just one thing on this, our, our press team, um, they picked up a bit of a story on this. So one of the benefits we got from this was an extended warranty on the work. So normally it was like four years for this kind of work, warranty. Because of the involvement in the specialists, we got 10 years. And our, our press team came up with this, this kind of strap line, which they, they said this was pothole-proof roads. And of everything, the members and the press loved it, to the point where I was on holiday uh, in Portugal, and I got a text message from my mum saying, you're on the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Now, generally, when you're a corporate director in a local authority, the last thing you want is to be on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, but it was actually good news. So, you know, that, they loved that. That kind of line was, was really positive. Quality control, apprentices, uh, lean program, and then the environmental benefits. And, and this was the net zero element of this. So you, you can see this program was driven by cost savings, um, but what we saw as well was environmental benefits. Um, now, the program was for five years, so it started in 2013, it finished in 2018. Uh, this is what we achieved, we got 12.5% savings um, in the end. Um, the actual savings on the, on the portion of the program that were eligible for savings were higher, but the actual program included elements that didn't attract the savings, so the overall figure was about 12.5%. Most schemes had a 10-year warranty, some had a 5- to 8-year warranty, because in some cases it simply wasn't economic to do anything differently. Very little uh, remedial work, very good safety record on the program. Um, and it won the Constructing Excellence Award for um, innovation. Uh, sorry, for collaborative working, even I got distracted. Um, the thing though on this, so the, the, the kind of the net zero benefit of this was around um, how we worked with tar bound material. So again, if I can go a bit engineering on you for a second. Uh, we used to build roads out of tar. Uh, we don't anymore, we build them out of bitumen. Um, tar is uh, perfectly fine, but if you try and dig it up, it's quite nasty, it's carcinogenic, and it has to be treated as a contaminated material. And therefore, the cost of dealing with it is quite high uh, in terms of financial, but also, of course, you're potentially dealing with a material that you're going to have to take to landfill. So environmental benefits are quite significant. Because we knew the quantity of tar we would be dealing with over this five-year period, one of the innovations we could introduce was a way of neutralizing the nasty stuff in the tar creating material that therefore had some value that could actually be reused. So it massively reduced our costs, but also, of course, it generated material that we could be reusing on our operations elsewhere. We could never have done that without that long-term visibility and without the innovation coming from the supply chain. Being conscious of the time, I will leap over a couple of county boundaries and I will, I will take you to the uh, to beautiful Oxfordshire. Um, so uh, 
After, um, after Surrey, I worked for Oxfordshire, but actually on secondment to Oxfordshire from, from Atkins. Um, again, very, very similar thing here. So Oxfordshire and Skanska were in a long-term contract. In this case, they were around about 10 years into that term contract, so they were well into, into it. But again, at this stage, um, particularly from Oxfordshire, they felt the need to do something different. And this time, the focus was much more around net zero. So their cabinet had declared a climate emergency, and short of buying a couple of electric vehicles, they hadn't really done that much about it. So they really wanted to know what can we do under the remaining life of this contract to actually help achieve our net zero ambitions. Um, there were some complications around this, which kind of helped us actually, because they were considering an extension to the contract. So we made a commitment to, to net zero and developing an alliance to achieve that, one of the conditions of extension, uh, and we worked through it uh, very successfully. A further complication was that Skanska uh, sold their infrastructure business to M Group Services halfway through, which um, didn't actually help us that much. But even so, uh, they still achieved quite a lot through this, through this approach. Um, what I will go on, um, I talked in Surrey about the, an alliance. Uh, when we did that, this was before FAC1 was actually available to us. Uh, we kind of used, I guess, an early version of it, but for Oxfordshire it was available, so uh, all parties committed to use FAC1. Uh, the contract they actually had in place was, was NEC, so FAC kind of sat there as an umbrella above that to create an alliance and to set out the objectives that the parties were all going to work to. Um, now, from this, a number of benefits that we achieved. Um, again, this is, there's nothing kind of innovative or earth-shattering about what they achieved, but it's, some of this is simply getting the basics right. So getting better at programming, getting better at um, planning works together, thinking about different materials, those kind of things really helped them. Um, this wasn't so much about financial savings, and the opportunity was limited, but there were some financial savings identified initially with further um, sought. Um, and eventually the contract extension, including the use of FAC1 to drive improvement, was agreed by their cabinet in April 2021. Um, I mentioned collaborative planning. I won't particularly talk about this, but just in terms of the organizations working better together at how they deliver operations was, was key. But, but this is probably the key one, just in terms of carbon reduction. And I guess, you know, to some extent, this, this is illustrative. But what they did was that they mapped out the activities that they were going to undertake on, over the remaining uh, period of the contract. So the client shared with them what was planned. What they then started to do is look at the innovations that over that period of time could be introduced that would enable them to achieve the reductions in carbon that they were committed to. And what this chart shows is basically how those interventions were mapped out. And you can see what it does is it takes them right down towards their net zero target by, by 2030. And again, it's that visibility, that long-term visibility of what you're planning to do, the early engagement of the supply chain, bringing in the specialists with some very clear strategic objectives to work to that was key to unlocking uh, the success for this one. Um, that is it for me. Um, I'll just leave you again. David mentioned that but the Alliance Steering Group, um, there is a page on LinkedIn, which um, if you aren't doing so already, I would urge you to follow some really interesting information on there that, that definitely is uh, worth a look at. And uh, as I probably galloped through that bit, but I probably talked too long, but any more then I'll be happy to talk to you over a glass of wine. Thank you. Now I know, I know people are very, very keen to have a drink and, and Renato needs to draw proceedings to a close. Do, are we allowed to do one or two questions, Renato? One question. Is there anybody who would like to raise a question? Um, because if you, if you and, and around has raised an eyebrow when he said, when he said one question, but there is someone at the back there, so do, you, you grab the opportunity, please. Okay, so given the uh, lack of standardization in measuring embodied carbon, even using digital tools like BIM, there's an awful lot of variety and there could be an awful lot of gaming of the system. I'd be interested in the panel's view and then the enforceability of a true net zero construction contract. Who would, like to, who would like to have a go at that? Jason, go for I it. I was just going to say, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, totally, absolutely. Um, one of the things we're trying to do at the moment, we're working with local authorities to try and develop a standard way of actually of measuring it, um, because otherwise it's hopeless, isn't it? If you can't measure it, you can't improve. Uh, and I, there is a real concern, I hear this from clients around the notion of greenwashing, you know, because without it, you can, you can make it look like you're doing good things when you aren't actually. And we've, we've just got to tackle that. 
Okay, I, I, you, you know where to find these speakers. You know that they're very, very experienced. Do please feel uh, free to, 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 to tackle them over a drink. Um, and do please feel that there are things we can do as construction professionals to advance this, not just command it, not just get fed up, but actually put together some different machinery. I will gladly now pass back to Renato to close the day's proceedings. Thank you so much. Thank you.